Well, it's a good day today. I'm uh, thankful to be in the house of the Lord. Yes. I want to talk today about doubt. That sounds like a real positive topic, doesn't it? Yeah. How many has ever been washing the dishes in the sink, right? And the drain gets clogged. Yeah. yeah. I like to cook the little ones and myself some eggs, and it's required to cook different types of eggs for different people. Have you ever <laughs> noticed that? <laughs> and uh, the fluffy eggs really requires, you lose egg. That's, that's what I've realized, because the bottom of the pan, there's always a layer. Now that layer has to go somewhere. It goes right in the kitchen strainer, right? And if you don't deal with that, the next time you wash dishes, you don't know what dishes you've washed, right? The water doesn't go anywhere. Have you ever had a clog? Yeah. Have you ever had some doubt that has hindered the flow in your life? I mean, I know I've got some forks and some silverware in there. I can't find them. I know I put a plate in there, but I can't see it. How many here has, has faith? I have great faith. I just can't find it right now. Uh, see, here's what I begin to realize. Faith, com uh, faith comes in concentrated form, and doubt comes in bulk. You can get bulk anywhere. You can get it at the gas. You can, you can get it at the gas station. You can get doubt at the Mennonite store. You can get doubt at Walmart. You can get it anywhere. They got it everywhere. Yeah. Now faith is something that you have to, you know, purpose and intend to have. Yeah, yeah. you're probably not going to find faith on the airwaves of national media. Find the but you will definitely find some other things. Yeah. Sometimes we have to get rid of some of the other things that have clogged up our space to reveal what we really do have. Yeah. Okay. See, there was this challenge of, oh, I don't have enough faith. Well, we're going to get to all the word and all this, but God is, he reveals in scripture, you don't need a lot of it. But here's the struggle that we have. We have a lot more doubt than faith. We've got this immense amount of it and we can't find our faith. And we think the answer is get more faith. And God's like, you don't need more faith. You need less of the other stuff. So what do we do about that? I think we should use the word to find out. In Matthew, uh, we're gonna be diving in here. Matthew chapter eight and verse 10 is where I want to get to, but the story begins. How many knows the story of the centurion? Yes. It says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. How many here has ever gone to God saying, God, I want to get in touch with you for someone else? The Lord, uh, my servant, is paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and I'll heal him. Well, that was easier than I thought. <laughs> do you hear that? If we come seeking God on behalf of someone else, do you know what God wants to do? I'll come and heal him. Wow. <clears throat> the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not even worthy that you could come under my roof, but just speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I'm also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. I mean, would you like to be the one who impresses Jesus? Yeah. Like, Wow. Now, this guy didn't go to church. Yeah. This guy didn't have religious. He, this guy wasn't even... We can all take a lesson from this. And this is what Jesus took away from this. He said, as surely as I say to you, I have not found such faith, such great faith, not even in Israel. 
I mean, the people that God has been like saving their butts for hundreds of years. Hmm. And I, I think this is just a, an interesting understanding here. Having faith. There was no doubt. In fact, he believed God so much that what God was willing to do, he said, you don't even have to do that. Just say the word. Yeah. Now, apparently, his drain was clean. Yeah. The title of my message today, I don't know if I said it or not, is Doubt Drain. We have to drain the doubt from our thinking, from our words, from our thoughts, from, from our actions, so that we can reveal the faith that we really do have. If we try to get more faith, I guarantee you, if we don't remove the doubt, it'll just be lost in the doubt. Because faith is what? It's concentrated and doubt comes in bulk. So you have to get rid of the doubt. You may not even have to get more faith. You may have enough already. But the doubt is just messing it up. So in Matthew, we see someone who had great faith, and really what they had also was just no doubt. They had no doubt that just simply talking to God on behalf of the person that was in need would be enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In Mark, let's jump to another story. In Mark chapter 3, Matthew, Mark... Mark chapter 3. The gospel, it's right there in my Bible. The gospel according to Mark. <laughs> uh, Mark chapter 3. So, <clears throat> Mark chapter 3 and verse 31. Uh, and so what we have here, this is praise the Lord. Mark chapter 5, that would make more sense if you would read your notes, Aaron. That would help so much. There we go. That makes way more sense. Mark chapter 5, and <clears throat> here we go. So there's a couple stories mixed in here. And Jesus is, again, he crossed over, verse 21, and he got to the other side, and there was a multitude that gathered, and, and uh, this was a story where Jairus' daughter was, right? She was um, sick, and so he begged earnestly that she's at death's door. She's about to die. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So again, someone is coming to Jesus saying, you have a source and we, we need your help. Do we wait to call on God at the last moment? Sometimes we wait till the last moment before we cry out. Even in those moments, that's, God does answer then. Now, but what I think is interesting here, now he's on his way. Jesus is now journeying to go and help. But now we have this uh, issue where the woman with the issue of blood, now she had been trying everything else for how many years? Gave, spent everything that she had to be healed. And no one could help her. And now you just be the guy who asked Jesus to come to your house. The bulk of doubt, right? Right? What was his? I mean, she's almost dead. Yeah. I mean, we are at the last. I don't have any time to waste. Right. And now we're getting stopped by Jesus himself. Stops and says, who touched me? He's, I mean, he's doing good things. I got to be patient. But I mean, hello. <laughs> have you ever been waiting on God? And he seems to be helping everyone else first. <laughs> oh, 
There's a fun song that while we were building the stage, he's never early, he's never late. We kids sing that one. It's a fun song anyway. Have you ever felt he's, he's late and he's, I wish he was early? <laughs> yeah. But he's not. He's right on time. And so Jesus goes through. He recognizes that someone had great faith and literally but just got in the presence of God and received the healing that they needed. Jesus didn't say anything. It just got close to the Spirit of God. See, what, what did we hear about last week? See, the Spirit of God came upon Jesus and it rested and it stayed with him. Yeah. Well, why did the woman with the issue of blood get healed and Jesus didn't lay hands on her and you know, do all that kind of stuff? Because she got close enough to touch the Spirit of God. That's where the power was. Yeah. Yeah. She got close enough to get in contact with her Creator. And because she believed in that, God did something about it. And Jesus recognized, whoa, God's doing something. The power of God has left me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Father, you're doing something. I would like to find out what you're doing. Right. Would you like to know what God's doing? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's look around and say, all right, who here, who here is pressing in to who God is? Who here is pressing into what God is doing? Yeah. Who here is saying, <laughs> no other options, God's my only chance? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So now, he continues on after that slight detour, and now the father is, <sighs> well, that took too long, right? And so, uh, um, while he was still speaking, some came to the ruler of the synagogues. Verse 35, your daughter is dead. Here we go. Too late. Here comes the bulk. Here comes everybody else's thoughts, everybody's opinion, everybody, well, if, you, if only you had gone earlier. If only that woman had left Jesus. If only, right? How am I? He still had faith in who God was, right? But now all these other things... Right? How many times do we, be, we, we speak to God, we talk to God, we, we pray, we pray correct, correctly, and then five minutes later happens. And then we get thinking about it. And all of a sudden, all the doubt pours in, and we couldn't find our faith if we had a snorkel and a scuba tank. We don't know where it went. And so, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Ah, wow, fear is probably right in this doubt category. It's believing something that's not true. So doubt is believing something. You could have faith all day long, but if you're believing something else, it really undoes the faith that you do have. So do not be afraid, only believe. And so he permitted no one to follow him. Wow, I mean, this is son of God in whom God is well pleased. Yeah. You know, there comes a point in our life where we're gonna have to turn off the sources of doubt. Yeah. If we're gonna press in and do what God wants us to do, Sometimes we're going to have to eliminate the inflow of doubt before, the out, before it can even drain away. If you want to stop an overflowing sink, the first thing you need to do is shut the water off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could plunge all day long, but if the water's still running, I mean, help yourself out, yeah. right? If you're trying to say, God, I need, I need faith, I need to believe, well, first... Turn off and stop listening to all the people that are contrary to what God is saying. Help yourself in that process. So Jesus even did this. He's like, you know what? I don't need any of their help. Sometimes we think, oh, we get a bunch of people praying and then all of a sudden God's going to hear. I don't really need anyone's help but God's help. I need the Spirit of God. 
If I'm doing his will, I don't need to convince him to do it. I need to not hinder him from doing it. And it doesn't matter what I say. I'm not going to tell God what to do. He's God. All right. So then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he he saw uh, to uh, to lit and and those who wept and wailed loudly. I mean, they are full on. It's over hopelessness. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, you can't get any more full, overwhelmed with doubt. I mean, Jesus didn't stop and say, "Oh, well, it's too late. Sorry." He's still coming. He's now here. And that no one has changed their opinion. They've now let the circumstance dictate their reaction. Even though the source that they had faith in is here. How many here has ever had the presence of God and still had doubt? What do you do about that? Pull the plug, clean the drain, and get rid of it so that you can experience what God wants to do in that moment. Yeah. All right, so what did Jesus do? He came to the house. He saw everybody was crying. And he, and he came and he said to them, why make this commotion? Why are you doing this? Why are you weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. What are you believing? There's two reports. We can believe the report of our situation or we can believe the report of what God wants to do in our situation. Those are usually two different things. But I guarantee you, the report you believe is the report you will have. What did they do? They ridiculed him. I'm giving you the answer and you're mocking me about it. Oh, this is the Son of God. They asked him to come here. How many of us, when God shows up, never early, never late, and he's about to do something, and, and we're like, uh, excuse me, God, I don't think you know what's going on. You really don't know what the situation, apparently you're not aware of the situation, because you don't have any doubt. Doubt's friend is flesh and circumstances and maybe even some facts, but it doesn't mean it's the truth. So they ridiculed him, but he had them all put outside. He's like, you asked me here, I'm going to get the job done. How about y'all leave? I don't really need your help to do that. So... He put them all outside. Then he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him. Remember, he only brought a few. A few good men. Maybe those that were willing to get rid of doubt. And he went and he entered where the child was laying and he took the child by the hand and he said to her, Talith ha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And after a long debate and praying and praying and praying, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, and finally, <laughs> how long do you think it takes for God to answer your prayer? How long does it take for God to answer your prayer when you're full of doubt? How many said the right thing but didn't believe it would happen? And so we get into this I've been praying for, you know, 40 days and three years and seven months and nothing's happened. I'm just believing. I mean, I'm doubting too, but I'm believing as well. I got five minutes a day of believing and, you know, 23 hours and 55 minutes of doubting because nothing's happening. What happened? Verse 42 says, Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. Here we are. The people who were there did not expect. Do you understand? When we're surprised that God does what he said he was going to do, and we're surprised about that, that lets us know that we did not pull the plug on the doubt. 
we did not have, we may have had faith, but it was drowning in doubt. It could not be found. They were amazed at what God had done, but he commanded them strictly that no one should know about this. I like Jesus. His, his marketing campaign is fantastic. Don't tell anybody what I did. Because he knows they're going. <laughs> he had reverse psychology going even then. And he, and he said to them, you know, maybe give her something to eat. She might be hungry. <laughs> There's something you do need to do in the natural. But there's also something that has to happen in the supernatural, right? Jesus simply tapped into the spirit of the Father. Do you understand? He had to get rid of the sources of doubt. He shut off all the other people wailing and whining and saying, God can't do this. God's too late. I tell you what, Job had a few of those friends. They, they told him, curse God and die. Well, thanks, that's not helpful. Do you understand doubt will not work with God? Yeah. Doubt is the enemy of who God is. Yes, sir. It, it, it is the opposite of faith. It undoes our faith. It undoes God's ability to do something. And so even Jesus said, let's get that out of here. Even for him to work on it. Yeah. He got rid of it. If he had to get rid of People, contrary to God's will, I guarantee you we need to as well. <laughs> Luke, it's not hard. Matthew, Mark, Luke. We're, we're catching one from every gospel here. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 24. If I read my notes right, the verse I'm looking for will be right there. Oh, Luke chapter 24. Now Jesus did not do what everybody there wanted him to do. They wanted him to throw out all the bad people that was oppressing them and kill them all and make them free. And what did he go and do? Went and died. <laughs> has, has God ever not done what you thought he was supposed to do? And he went and did something completely different. And you're like, why did you do that? That's not what I was praying for. I wonder why that didn't happen. We, we ask amiss, and then we think God didn't answer prayer. And God's like, you know, I'm sorry, but I wasn't doing that. <laughs> That's not my plan. I mean, do you understand the whole children of Israel keeping the commandments here and there, whatever they were doing, you know, struggling to figure out who God was there for a while. And then God does what he intended to do, which was prophesied. And they're like, um, but that's not what we wanted. Yeah. <laughs> but he was being obedient to the instruction of the father. Remember, he had that prayer, not my will, but yours be done. It wasn't even his will to do this but it was the Father's will. Yes. Now all that took place, and now the disciples, there are, uh, so there's a group of people that drew near to a village and they were going, and um, so, I'm sorry, we got a lot, there's a lot in this story I'm trying to get to the point, but yet give you the, the everything here. They're on the road to Emmaus, right? And Jesus appears to them, and, uh, and they're, they're not having a good day, right? There's verse 23, let's jump in here. Uh, when they did not find his body, they came saying uh, that they'd also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman said, but they, we did not see him. And, and Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Yeah, I, I mean, didn't you, didn't you read your Bible? Yeah. <laughs> Weren't you at the synagogue when I picked up the scroll and read what I was going to do that Isaiah said I was going to do? No, you weren't there. Okay. That's a bad day to miss church. <sighs> Good. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, you know, when Jesus is preaching, you should show up. Okay, O oh, foolish one, slow of heart to believe. Ought not the Christ, having suffered these things, enter into his, into his glory? So then they drew near to the village, and they were going, and, and so uh, he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they said, hey, come, come, and, and stay with us, for the day is far spent. And he went in with to stay with them. Now understand, they don't know who he is. Right, yeah. right. They are saying, I can't find my Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> well. I got some things to tell him. He didn't do what I wanted him to do. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened. And they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to another, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us? I mean... Doggone it, we should have recognized it. Do we read the word? Do we come to church and we go, oh, that's the presence of God, but we're like, we don't recognize it's the presence of God? And then we're like, oh, all this time that was God. Now, I grew up in this church. I was born here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we traveled as, at a young age. And so, or I was, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And we got to um, Ranzas Pass, Texas. And I was helping laying hands on people at the altar, right? And so I'd been in church, preached, done all that stuff for years. And all of a sudden I'm laying hands on someone and they were touched by God and fell down, slain in the spirit. What in the world, slain? The Christian language is so crazy. I slain him in the spirit. His physical body was overwhelmed with the presence of God. And I felt that. And I thought, oh, I've felt that for years. I didn't fall down that time or the other time. But I was praying for this young man, and he did. And I thought, all this time, I felt the presence of God and thought the air conditioner was on, you know? <laughs> I, I, I felt it, but I, I felt this tingling in him, you know, and I'm like, okay. But I didn't know what it was. And then in that moment, my eyes were open. Oh, that's God doing something. I'm sorry that I didn't recognize that. There was power in that. There was the same power in all those other times, but my eyes weren't open to it. When our eyes are open to it, we begin to say, oh, what do you want to do with that? So the disciples, oh, snap. Now they had just journeyed I don't know, 12 miles, walked all day long. I'm pretty sure they weren't riding their go-karts or anything. And so now they decided, well, let's get up and go tell everybody what happened because, hey, we just saw the Lord. So they rose that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem and found the, eve, uh, found the 11 who were who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told him about the things that had happened on the road, and he was known to them when they broke bread. Now, I don't know if this was 30 seconds later or five minutes later, but it says, right now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of him. I mean, like, not... Knock, knock on the door. Like, hey, what we doing, guys? <laughs> and Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. 
I mean, hello, your prayers have been answered. You've been looking for the body. God answered your prayer and you're terrified. Oh, man. You just told him about Do you know, I wonder if God doesn't answer our prayer sometimes because we would be scared out of our bridges if he did. See, he really does know what we believe, not what we say. All right, here we go. Here's what the red prince says. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Doubt overcome them. In the moment of the answer, the visually seeing that, doubt overcame them. Now, did they just all of a sudden say, oh, no, I don't believe in God anymore. They weren't renouncing their faith, but they were overcome with doubt and fear. Yeah. Does that happen in our life? We go to minister, we go to pray for someone, we go to help someone, and then all of a sudden we're right at that moment and doubt overwhelms us yeah. right at that crucial moment. He said, behold my hands and my feet that I... It, it's, it's me. See me, touch me. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you have. And when he said this, he showed, him, showed them his hands and feet. And while they did not believe for joy and marveled, uh, he said to them, have you any food? I mean, do you hear this? They still did not believe. God has answered prayer before. He's done that. He's done what people have needed and then they still don't believe. What would happen if you're, the very thing you have need of right now was answered and solved? Would you still have doubt? Would thoughts come moments after? God needs us to learn how to drain that doubt away so that we can reveal the faith that we do have so that when the manifestation of God's will being done happens, we're in time with him, we're in step with him instead of God's done it and we still aren't even believing that it's going to happen. These are the disciples. They were with him. They saw him and were physically seeing him in that moment. And they weren't believing. Then he had food with them. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb and he took it and ate. And then he spoke to them. These are the words which I speak to you. I had to do all of these things. This, this was what my job was. I came and was obedient, Right? Repentance and remission of sins has to be preached. A change in our way of thinking, a turning around has to take place. And he paid for that. Yeah. That had to happen. Now, there was someone who didn't, the, he was not in the meeting. How many know who that was? He has not, uh, you know, sir or gentleman or mister in front of his name. He has doubting in front of his name. Yeah. How many times do we label ourselves by our actions as doubting? Yeah. Now, we may have not made it in the Bible with that as our name, but this guy was there. He missed when Jesus said, touch me. Yeah. See, I am who I say I am. He, he wasn't there for that moment. John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Go to John. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Now, verse 24 is, is where this begins. And so now Thomas, the twin, you know, doubting Thomas, that's how we all know him, right? <clears throat> 
so after eight days, his disciples are again inside, and Thomas was with them this time, right? And Jesus came, and the doors being shut again, and he stood in the midst, and he said, Peace to you. Now, apparently this time, or either John didn't talk about it, but not everybody was afraid. It had happened once already, right? And he said to Thomas, now again, Thomas had just said, right? This is what Thomas, unless I see his hands and put the nails and my finger into the print of the nails, I don't believe. I mean, he not only had doubt, he had belief in not believing and he was willing to declare what it was. Now, I don't know if he was like, well, you guys all got to. But there's an interesting moment here. Do you know what? I didn't get to either. I don't know if you were there when he came and he showed himself, but I don't think you got to put your hand where the nail imprint was. So in this moment, Thomas He thought he had a little bit of a right to ask this question, right? Well, I don't know. Boom, Jesus showed up. And he said to Thomas, reach your hands, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving. Unbelieving is believing something else. But believing... And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now this, I like this verse because I have not seen. I was not at that meeting and and that wasn't my fault. I wasn't doing something else. But this right here, hear that. Blessed are you that you believe and you weren't at that moment. Jesus was saying that for all of our sake. Because his hope is that you don't have to see me to believe me. So even doubting Thomas was able to change. But even Jesus had to tell him, you have to stop believing the doubt. And recognize that the enemy is going to sow that. In pre-service prayer, Nate was praying about there's words, and words have power. And sometimes we have to turn off those sources so that we can find our faith. Yeah. If, if, our, if we're struggling to believe It's because we're being drowned by all the stuff that we shouldn't be believing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Let's go to Acts. It's not very far away. Acts chapter 9. Now, the Apostle Peter. Yes? Yes? He was going, uh, so story here, right? So he was at Joppa. There was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. The woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and she died. And when they had washed her and laid her in the upper room and And since Lydia was near Joppa and the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him to not delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the windows stood, all the widows stood by weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which she had made. And uh, and she was with them. But Peter put them all out. He, He got... He, he's like, you know, I've seen Jesus do this. Step one, remove everybody else who does not believe what God wants to do. 
You know, we hear these phrases, prayer closet. I don't know about you, but I can't fit in any of my closets. <laughs> because there's stuff in the closet, right? You know, <clears throat> too much, I'm sure. But I, it, you know, it, I can't fit in my closet, right? It, sometimes we don't have to go hide. We just need to clean out the space where doubt is right where we're at, right where God wants to do something, we have to get out the sources of doubt. So he put them out and he knelt down and he prayed and he turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And again, three days later in the belly. How long did it take for God to answer an earnest prayer without doubt, fully believing she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he, he didn't even have to give her his hand before she responded. Look at this. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when she had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. And so it was that he stayed there many days. We have to put doubt out of our thoughts. We got to put doubt out of our minds. We got to put doubt out of our surroundings so that we can find the faith that we really do have. Yeah. James chapter one and verse five, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. Well, that sounds good. Lord, I need wisdom. I've said that. I believe he's helped me with some things that I didn't go to school to learn how to do. He's helped me learn how to do them. Yeah. But this is what you have to do. You have to, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Because one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. So this is the challenge we have. I came to church, I came to the, the Pentecost service, and I believed, I felt God. And then I was drowning on Monday. Doubt came right in and I heard all those things and it began to sway my thoughts, it began to sway my thinking. I, you know, I was overwhelmed with those things, right? Peter, walking on water. In the moment, I don't know how much more faith you can have. He was doing the miraculous. And he took his eyes off that and he began to listen to the, the wind and the waves, right? And he's like, he began to think about what he was doing. Can you believe what I'm doing right now? This is not possible. And look how big the waves are. I don't have a surfboard. I don't have a bodyboard. I don't even have a floaty. What am I doing? I mean, I was believing God, but look at all the other things that are here to believe. And it began to sink. I mean, I went to church. I was believing God. And then... I was believing a whole lot of other stuff right after service. I didn't get very far in the miraculous because I began to believe something else. I doubted what, I, what was happening. Do you understand? The miraculous was taking place. He was looking down at the water. I can only do that for one hundredth of a second. Have you ever jumped in the water? I mean, there is a moment that you are just on top of the water. I've, you know, I've watched my son try to walk on water as he runs, but he's in slow motion. He's just falling in the water. That's really all that's happening. He, he was walking on it. He, God was doing something in his life. And then the situation. Now, this guy would have stayed in a perfectly good boat, but you know, <laughs> that doesn't make for a great story. You know? I have faith in this boat. Yeah. Look, I'm sitting on water. 
<laughs> yeah, it must be not. <laughs> but that's not in the story, you know? So, who cares, you know? But, <clears throat> wow, doubt is strong. What does it go? It comes in bulk. Faith comes in concentration form. It may be easy to misplace our faith because we can get busy holding up a whole lot of other things. So what does it say here, James? It says, because one who doubts is like a wave in the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. But God, I prayed. Yeah? Yeah? but you believed something else while you were praying it. Like, just think about it. You prayed the right thing, but your brain was thinking, this is never going to work. He's probably not going to do this. He's probably busy. But we say, I, I prayed. Is that really prayer? Is that really believing? Because it says here, you must believe and not doubt. You can believe all day long, but if you're still doubting, it undoes all the believing. Yeah. Such a person is double-minded and an unstable in all that they do. If we think the answer is I must get more faith, the famous verse of Scripture about faith, well, Lord, we tried to cast the devil out, why couldn't we do it? That's the context of all that. No one really talks about that part of it, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but if you would just have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could move mountains. And now people are trying to move mountains. I don't know about you, but I think the dirt's perfectly fine where it is. I think people have tried to use faith for a lot of stuff that God had no intention. He's like, if I want it moved, I'll shake the earth and let it move on its own. Right. What mountains was he talking about? You'll be able to move the mountain of addiction and you'll be able to move the mountain of pride and fear and what will... You be able to, when will you be able to do that? When you believe and not doubt. And you don't have to go get more faith. A little bit goes a long way. Reveal the faith that you have by draining the doubt. Recognizing when there's a source of doubt that is undoing your faith. Because you can try to get more faith all day long. He, he, he goes on to say, faith is a grain of mustard seed. Why did he talk about mustard seeds? What does that, it's just a little seed. A tiny seed. Concentrated. You know, it doesn't get much more concentrated, but in a seed is everything that that plant will produce, right? Your faith has great potential. But that potential will never be seen if we don't reveal our faith. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of our faith in moments can be overcome by doubt. Sure. So today we want to reveal our faith. We want to drain the doubt so that we are not unstable. So that we can believe and not doubt. The first step to not doubting, I think, is number one. We have to stop the sources that are doubt. If someone is, is saying they believe, but the next word they say is contrary to the word of God, you have to just put them out. Remove them from the input to your thoughts. Remove them from the input so that you might believe. When God wants to do something and we think, oh, you want me to pray for that person. You want me to go do that. You want me to say that. We have to believe in that moment and not doubt. We can say, not my will, but yours be done, God. And the next thing is, okay, God, am I doubting what you said? Am I doubting what you instructed me to do? And if so, 
first I got to clean up all this mess. Because I'm going to, at the bottom of cleaning out this sink and getting rid of all this junk and draining the trash away, because you have to understand that's what trash is, that's what doubt is, it's trash. It's garbage. You got to clean it out and then you will find you had faith all along. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be seeking in this day and age the truth if you didn't have faith. Father, I thank you today that you are revealing what the dirty, nasty thing doubt is. And you're helping us get rid of that so that we can see and experience the power of the faith that we have in you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that today the, the prayers that we've prayed and we've said, God, why has nothing happened? The, the things that we've, we, I did this, God, I did the right thing, but nothing happened. Well, God, oh, forgive us for allowing there to be more doubt in our thoughts and in our mind and in our vocabulary and in our words than there was faith. Father, we've, we've had in our hands a powerful tool and a great tool, but we've also had some other things in our hand. And those things have made the faith ineffective. So today, God, I thank you that you help us drain the doubt. When Jesus came and he appeared before them, he said, peace to them. He, he began with, I have, the first thing I have to do is combat the doubt that they are already experiencing just by me being here. The enemy comes immediately to steal, to kill and destroy. He, he comes immediately to bring doubt, to, to undo the effect of what God's doing. He counter, he tries to counter the opposite of what God is doing at every turn. And so as soon as we begin to recognize doubt for what it is and we begin to call it sin, and we recognize it and now we, we have a, a tool to overcome it. The blood of Jesus, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The blood of Jesus has paid a price. I don't have to believe that way. I don't have to think that way anymore. The crown of thorns, he, he took that so that our doubt would be poured out. And that we would have the mind of Christ, the, the mind of uh, my, my thoughts are on the anointing of God. My thoughts are on the spirit of God. And as I think on those things and, and meditate on those things, I'm not meditating on the opposite of God. I'm meditating on who he is. And it changes the response that is produced by God. He doeth the work, but boy, he sure does need a vessel that believes in him does not doubt. If you're online today, if you're in the house today and you're saying, that all sounds good, but I still am overcome with doubt. I can't find the drain plug. Help me. Then that's what we're here today to do. To, to agree with you, to lay hands, to just help that process of getting rid of the, the doubt in our lives so that faith can be found and be risen up in our thoughts and our hearts and our words. Father, I thank you today that you're just simply washing us, you're cleaning us, you're helping us get rid of and recognize the source, the source of doubt, that one person that keeps saying something that it may be fact, but it is not the truth. It's contrary to the word of God. It's contrary to the plan of God for your life. So Father, I thank you that we begin to put out, we begin to separate, we, be, we intentionally right now, we begin to decide who, who am I not going to allow to influence me anymore because they have been drowning my faith. I'm not going to listen to that anymore. I'm not going to let that overcome me. I thank you, Heavenly Father, as we commit to do that, when we're going to see faith rise in us. We're going to see the... The miracles, the miraculous happen because we're able to hear and say what you're saying. We give you thanks today, Heavenly Father, for your word. Thank you for this example that you've given us. And 
and that even you had to remove doubt so that you could operate and function in this earth. So we recognize that. We begin to take that in our everyday life that we will see a change from this day forward.